Bar in the Rain, a classic, almost cliched state of affairs, famous for its thermal waters since Roman times. The city then developed around that reputation to the point of becoming a business. Before long, the first modern casino was born, going on to attract celebrities from all over Europe. Of these, the Tsar Peter the Great just said that he liked to cut his vodka with soda water from the locality. The generic term of spa for local water also has its origins here, and there's certainly been enough of that on the track here over the years to trouble even the greatest of drivers right here in the Ardennes Forest. The spa circuit itself has also contributed greatly to the reputation of the region. Since the late 19th century, when motorists first started to gather, motorsport have always been quickly into the spotlight. Formula One, endurance, touring cars and bikes have all visited this area. In 1924, it held the first edition of the Spa 24 Hours race, just one year after the first running of the Le Mans event. The circuit was then 14 kilometres long, a triangular plot of Malmedy, Stavelot and Francochon where Henri Pescarolo in a Matra holds the record at an average speed of over 262 kilometers per hour. However, the new track, now trimmed down to seven kilometers, opened in 1979 and has kept the ingredients and atmosphere of the ancient spa experience very much alive, while pushing safety further up the agenda. Nuvolari Caracciola, both Ascari and his son, Fangio, Clark, Senna, Schumacher, Spa has always attracted the greatest. A place full of history and national pride, which already had its own museum, but not a major historical event. An anomaly that Peter Otto to experience the Le Mans Classic. The Royal Automobile Club of Belgium decided to remedy. Here is Patrick Peter. He says that the circuit wasn't permanent. Therefore, the open competition in the area led to a strong involvement of the population. They were asked to change a few of their habits, and so local issues were always taken into account. De tout le tissu local. Et c'est vrai qu'on retrouve un peu la même chose ici. Of course, it would have been churlish to mess with a proven recipe, and now backed by his enormous wealth, the Spa Classic can offer a new perspective. Well, spa is a very broad circuit, so there's always the opportunity to race here. From Le Mans, the cars of the 24-hour race evolved, but it's clear that no other cars really use the big circuit. Here you can rotate with touring cars. There's been a fantastic championship. The circuit can also be tuned into GTs, prototypes and, of course, Formula One. All disciplines are legitimate here, and it will allow us to deal with different themes every year, keeping the show fresh and vital. It's a huge celebration for the motor enthusiasts and open to the whole family with animations, theme paddocks, a large selection of clubs and of course six classes of competition in chronological order. The Trofeo Nastro Rosso is open to GTs and other Italian sports cars produced before 1966. The 60s endurance event is for GTs from pre-1966 of any nationality and also open top sports cars from before 1963. Classic endurance racing is for GT and prototype cars made between 1966 and 1979. In eight years of existence, this category has become European and perhaps even global in terms of both quality and quantity. The crowd to the Challenger Saab involving passenger cars and approved tourists from between 1947 and 1976. Then we go back in time with the Group C racing dedicated to prototypes that participated in the FIA Group C, IMSA or GTP. And finally, the grand finale, Boss GP bringing you cars from Formula 1, IndyCar, GP2 and of course Formula 3000. Well, it's an enticing programme, but before we get stuck into the thick of it, let's have a look at the official opening of the first edition of the Spa Classic. It's Friday, May the 27th, with a gala dinner at the Drivers' Club at the foot of Eau Rouge, which was once an old customs house. Prussian until 1871, and then German until 1920.
Now to the heart of the matter with the first race of the meeting, the Trofeo Nastro Rosso. Italian cars are featured, beginning with Ferraris in their droves as they're deprived of their own historic challenge. But do look out for other brands as well, beginning with the Maserati Birdcage, driven by Germany's Max Werner from pole position. Now we're on board the Ferrari 250 GT Berlinetta of Vincent Gay. There's a big slide for the Maserati under acceleration coming out of La Source. But after the turn at La Source, he can't take advantage before a Rouge. Off down the straight then that leads to the Le Combe Chicane. The Ferrari is about the power of the V12 before slowing down while all the time keeping brake wear in mind. In third and fourth, the powerful Bizzarini 5300GT GT and an ISO A3C. They're on the lookout while the Ferrari 275 GTB, written by American Dennis Singleton, completes the top five. Second time round, and it's time for Vincent Gay to tackle La Source with a certain amount of style. Well, the penalty is immediate. Max Werner and Michael Ehrlich go past. A few moments late, the ISO of Alberto Franchioni also benefits. Another change of leader, and it's now Ehrlich in the Bizzarini up front, but the entire top five is still up for grabs. As you can see, though, even if fair play is a golden rule, competition is rather intense. And you may have noticed that disturbing smoke signal coming out of the back of Ehrlich's car. He's still going for the moment, but a pit stop seems inevitable. Ehrlich now followed by the ISO of Alberto Franchioni and then the Ferrari of Vincent Gay. Werner's Maserati are dropping back, plagued by mechanical problems and will surely soon be forced to retire. Now it's time for Franchioni to take command, but his ISO seems to be the least stable of these cars under braking. Designed by Giotto Bizzarini, both the ISO and the Bizzarini a representation of a Ferrari 250 GTO, but with a few improvements. The 250 GTO, on which he himself had carried out part of the development before leaving the Maranello firm, powered by Chevrolet horses, his cars won their class of both Sebring and Le Mans in 1964. At Spa in 2011, they still show their speed, but are less reliable than the Ferrari Berlinetta, which takes command in spectacular fashion. A little while later, Mary Virginia, the only lady driver in this field, is battling with her Alfa Romeo Giulietta SZ, which finally finishes safely in 17th place. Meanwhile, then, Marcel Gay takes the race win. Well, to be honest, I was expecting to finish in third place. I really feared the Maserati of Max Werner, which is an excellent car driven by an excellent driver. The Bizzarini is extremely powerful, but less reliable, which is pretty amazing for a car of such a size. However, I did give the best of myself, I think, throughout the race, and others have had a few problems and made some small mistakes, and we just try to make fewer than they do. So a home win for Vincent Gay, then on a track that he knows so well. Well, back in the 1970s, I drove on the old 14-kilometer circuit, it is a little different today, but it remains as mythical as ever, and I still enjoy coming here. On to the second race then, with the grid decided by the results from the first race of the weekend. We start on the fourth line of the grid on board the Ferrari 275 GTB of Jeremy Lansvet, with the Bizzarini of Michael Ehrlich on our right. At the first turn, it's the Ferraris monopolising the first five positions, but by O Rouge, Ehrlich has already risen to second place, and he sets off in hot pursuit of Vincent Gay.
On the other hand, our man with the camera is now in eighth place, but he'll soon be making up one of those places by besting the Ferrari 250 GT Berlinetta, a Christian Dumoulin. Gay and Michael Ehrlich burn off their pursuers, but the Bizzeri just can't find a position to attack from. That gap will continue to widen as the laps run down. At the time, Heinz Ulrich Weisselmann had it to the reputation of the 250 GT at Berlinetta by saying, docile is a summer love, an absolute pleasure on four wheels today, even today in range for the lucky few. Well, Valson Gay certainly a man likely to agree. His style impeccable as he grabs his second victory of the weekend. A perfect return from his two races. Yeah, it's better. Happy for you. A constant in all events organised by the Peter Auto team, clubs are in the spotlight. Lotus, Porsche, Aston Martin, Triumph, Ferrari, MG. In total, nearly 500 cars were installed in the aisles of Spa to give the spectators a chance to take in this majestic exhibition. As a bonus for participants, there's also the opportunity to take to the track and discover the beauty of this circuit from the comfort of their own vehicles. At the same time, track baptisms were held. The choice of Ferrari 458 or Nissan GTR. Rear wheel drive or all wheel drive, but always more than 500 horses a minimum provide the maximum of thrills. To reconcile the need for both competition and shopping, the stands used for Formula One were converted into a shopping mall devoted to the automotive world. It's difficult not to yield to the passion and the ambient mood. It's a special day. It's not raining at Spa today, and we're surrounded by legendary cars. And this is one I'm really happy to participate for the first time in a race full of historic cars. This looks as though it should be an absolutely outstanding meeting. So then, an all-new discipline for Philippe Alliot to get to grips with. Well, certainly it's nothing like a modern car, however, it is still difficult to properly drive faster race car, any car, period. Under these conditions, I'll try to do the best with the car I have. I'll not deny that it isn't the uh, best handling car I've ever driven, though. And you? Well, he was kind enough to tell me to feel the ride of an older car in order to give me an impression of the car compared to that of an F1 car over the last ooh, 20 years or so. Not very nice for the wonderful 1964 AC Cobra of his friends, Francois Kik. Just like the TVR Griffith and equipped with the same American V8, it's one of the scarecrows in the 60s endurance category, whose field is composed of 41 cars battling it out in a two-hour race. Once behind the wheel, though, this commercial pilot quickly moved to the front. Despite its disadvantages, it's going pretty well for Philippe Palio. He takes a few hundred metres to move from sixth to first place. The car's now behind him, not lacking in pace either. Alio proving then that his talents as a driver are still intact, while exercising some caution under braking and overtaking. And he continues to increase his advantage while behind him. It's quite a battle between the TVR Griffith of McClerney and pole sitter Hugenholtz in his Cobra.
As a connoisseur, Francois Kik appreciates the work of his teammate. For others, though, it's already time to head back to the pits. Some of the cars simply haven't withstood the efforts of their drivers. Often, though, this is set against the talents of the mechanics and their race and continue a little later. This will not, unfortunately, be the case for Philippe Alliot on the 14th lap and already with a 10-second lead, the fun comes to an end. The Frenchman disappointed, but the record will show that his first experience of historical racing was certainly action-packed. Well, it's always nice to race, and there I had a great car. Unfortunately, there's a small recurring uh, problem that had already popped up yesterday. There was a manufacturing fault on the rocker arm, but I still had so much fun. We must adapt. Uh, it's not easy to drive cars like these against more modern machines, but you have to make do with the difficulty. The passion, though, is still in my veins. It's in my blood, and I had a lot of fun. Uh, it's like being a child again, really. To the running order, then, the Cobra of Hans Hugenholtz moved back into the lead ahead of the number three AC Cobra and the TVR Griffith of Sean McInerney. Approach the window for the driver change. So now there's a chance for everyone to stop, top up the fuel tanks, check those tyre pressures, change that driver, and for those stepping out of the car, take on some much needed fluid refreshment. After that phase of the race, the number 27 Cobra, now driven by David Hart, is still ahead of the TVR Griffith, who moved up one place, while third position is occupied by the AC Cobra of Ludovic Carroll. The performance index allows the older cars with a smaller displacement to develop. Again, the Triumph TR2 of Fabrice Mestre moves ahead of the oldest car on the track. That's a 1948 Skoda Sport, driven by Miroslav Kresja. So then, victory for David Hart and Hans Hugenholz putting together a perfect race. He did the start and uh, Philippe Alio uh, tow away and uh, he blow up his engine. So that's why he fall out. But I'm, I'm pity, I like to race against him because I raced together with him, the 24 hour race here, so I know him. But I, I started with 140 litres of fuel so the car was very heavy. Yeah and that we felt in the beginning, but later on it got better. The podium ceremony for the 60s endurance category brought Saturday to its end, but many of the day's protagonists will be back in action the following morning. As in the past two editions of the Le Mans Classic, aspiring pilots aged 7 to 12 years old became involved in the event. After practice sessions on a circuit layout within the paddock where they have benefited from the valuable experience of their instructors, the next generation was ready to show off on the real circuit. replicas of prestige cars they have put together an assault on the downhill stretch leading to Eau Rouge. Perhaps future careers have been inspired, evidenced by the broad smiles on the children's faces by the end of the Little Big Spark Parade.
the Spa Classic The Soapbox Race. And this opinion enjoyed by adults and children alike, wooden box or cigar alone or in tandem and perhaps helped by a little bit of Dutch courage. Driven only by the force of gravity, these strange devices allow the holding of competitions in all seriousness and highly regulated too. But the goal is simple, get down the hill as quickly as possible. A training track was laid out in the paddock and for the more adventurous on a Saturday night after the main races were finished, an opportunity was there to take to the circuit itself. Departing from Lacombe, it's a three in one slope with a height difference of 52 metres. From the hill start, the acceleration hits. The fastest was clocked at 104 kilometers per hour, at just five inches off the ground. That must have been quite a ride. though it's a pleasure open to all aged 7 to 77 years young. Well, I'm with my boyfriend, I'm driving and he operates the brakes. It's called a carriola and it's completely made of wood. There's a steering wheel to turn with the tyres underneath, glued pieces of tyre that grip the road, and that's how it slows down. Well, with this I've never had an accident, but it's been six years since I've driven in different categories. Before I had a box and I had an accident, I managed eight rolls at 90 kilometres an hour. However. I was well protected and thus just got a concussion, a broken wrist, yeah, nothing special really. So not bad? Well, yeah, not bad. Now the Spa Classic also has its VIP side, especially since new boxes were installed above the brand new F1 pit. Next to the track, aiding the tracking, the performance is on the track in the best possible conditions. motor racing history, Audemar Piguet could not miss such an event as co-title sponsor and official timekeeper. The opportunity to watch is great for his hunger, for excellence whether on the track or on the wrist. There's a natural alliance between automotive and mechanical watches. There are the same passions, the same taste of the craft. I like that it's art applied behind me that works. In fact, it's closely related to the emotions and passions. So it's a natural alliance. Are you inspired by such events? We see that there are new productions related to it. How does it inspire you? Well, there's always an emotional charge that allows us to make beautiful things, new things. We're always exploring new avenues that couldn't be explored a hundred years ago. It is, in fact, an intellectual challenge to do things mechanically, beautiful objects that elicit emotion. That's the philosophy obviously shared far and wide. Sunday morning, the paddocks are alive to the sound of classic endurance racing. Since the birth of the discipline, the grid has always consisted exclusively of authentic models, and it continues to grow. At Spa, there were 83 cars entered, and therefore two separate sets. Using their berth to separate them, we start by bringing together 
classic endurance races and tours entered in competition between 1966 and 1974, and the prototypes from 1966 to 1972. With all the cars under preparation, it's the astonishing, or rather the out of place that catches the eye. The Helmet TX of Javier Michelon, a prototype powered by a helicopter engine, an original concept that stands somewhere between the automotive and aerospace industries. Its engine develops 350 brake horsepower, 880 newton meters of torque. Its maximum engine speed is an astonishing 57,000 revs per minute. Well, there were two cars. The second is still in the USA. I fell in love uh, at the sight of those lines because I just love the Porsche prototypes and Chaparral, and this car is a bit of a mix of the two. Et euh, cette voiture, c'est un petit peu un, un mélange des deux en termes de ligne. Donc c'est vrai que d'abord, c'est la ligne. I was concerned about Ensuite, originality because I really wanted to have the real euh, thing, which has been little used in racing. Là, History has shown us this is not always the case. C'est des voitures qui étaient peu utilisées en course. Euh, je dirais que l'histoire de la voiture est très limpide, ce qui est malheureusement pas toujours le cas. Elle est au fin fond des États-Unis. Well, she was in the USA and was restored in 1996 by Bob McKee, the manufacturer. We had a lot of surprises though, Bob McKee is still alive. I phoned him and asked what would happen if we broke something on the car. And without saying anything, he sent me a big parcel with all the plans of the car. Also in the prototype category, Pierre Nicolet is under the watchful eye of his father Jacques. The small BMW engine powering his Chevron B16 doesn't allow him to be a leading light, but if he continues to display this level of performance, he should soon be moving up to the next level. Richard Mille in his Lola T70 can certainly compete, but that's entirely the point. Well, these are cars that made us all dream. These are cars that go very fast and also for many of them they were perhaps in the hands of legendary drivers so it's very enjoyable. There's a myth, a dream that is created around it. The circuits are wonderful with the levels of safety now in place. This is the perfect setting to have some fun and to have a bit of a dream. C'est vraiment c'est un cadre parfait pour pour s'amuser et et puis rêver. Well, many simply want to keep wandering around the pre-grid as the setting is gorgeous, a delight shared by everyone. But once it's time to get started, we're quickly pulled from this reverie and the heat is very much on. From the first turn, the battle rages between the Lolas who've been hogging the front of the grid. The time being, Bernard Tuna and Claude Nahum are going well, but David Hart, who won the 60s endurance race the previous day in the company of Hans Hugenholz, is also pressing hard. Pierre en France in third closely monitors the situation, while Dan in fifth is the first non Lola, the Chevron B16 of Olivier Casellares. The GT class is itself headed by the number 12 Ford GT40, shared by Claude Nahum and Bernard Tuna the same Geo that drives the leading Lola. At the end of the first lap, David Hart emerges in the lead, pursued by Tuna Nahun and France. In Proto 2 litres, Olivia Calizares fights with the 3 litres, while the 40T40 remains ahead of a handful of prototypes. The status quo is reached until the release of the safety car. The timing of the two leading cars visits to the pits now vital. Strategy all important here while the window is still open. David Hart will go immediately before stopping a second time. While Tuna Nahum will remain in situ for a little longer. It's all worked well for Pierre Alain France. He now finds himself leading the race. In GT, Tun and Nahum had enough in hand to remain in the lead, but in prototypes, they're now second. And behind them, the threat of David Hart as he posts lap record after lap record in attempting to get back to the front.
waltz back in a second place. Hart chases Pierre Alain France and eventually gets past on the 18th lap of the race. Going on to seal his second win of the weekend. Out of the top yeah. and you have to, uh, to push pretty yeah, hard. A little bit too early. <laughs> and then, uh, but uh, I, I, I actually I drove from the wrong tie, so you see the car. Sorry? 83. Uh, okay, okay, bye bye. And that's all we know. The Belgian race stewards are adamant that David must go onto the podium to pick up his champagne. And the sooner, the better. So now we move on to the Asavi Challenge and Group 1, which was the first appearance for this category in a Peter Auto event. With the 55 cars at the start, a monstrous Plymouth Hemicuda imposed itself both physically and with its technical characteristics, weighing in at 1,800 pounds, generating 550 brake horsepower through its 7-litre V8 engine, with brakes to spare even for an 80-minute race. It's Christoph Schwartz, he says, well, it's a Plymouth Hermit Acuda. Uh, we built according to the model Yves de Pre Bertinchon raced here at the 24 Hours of Spa in 1973, 74 and 75. This is to honour those crazy people from the time she was built. At the time, she never finished because the first year the driver fell sick. The second year, she had a mechanical problem. And the third time round, she was involved in an accident. She's been eternally unlucky in its hope to ward off all of that today. <laughs> The objective clear for Christoph Schwartz finished the race without trying to compete with the Porsche 911 that dominated the trials. The 911 immediately comes to mind as well. The Plymouth, well, it's certainly the right car to be in on the straights. However, the Plymouth slightly less assured under braking and in the windy bits. Once again, though, the Hemicuda's visit to the Arden will be an unhappy one, though. Mechanical problems proving its downfall. Meanwhile, the victory goes to the 3-litre Porsche RSR, driven by Christophe Terrio and Pierre Gary. <laughs> Our continued journey back in time now takes us back to the classic endurance class and the second half of the field, which includes a rather marvellous Porsche 935 Moby Dick. Car just out of the Freisinger Motorsport Workshop after three years of restoration work to an extremely rare model. A sacred quest, says Gotts van Blücher. I know about three. One is in the Porsche Museum. One is not, not existing anymore because it was a testing car. And this were, they tried to build up the spare car. And we found the car in the USA, in the States and found also some parts in all, the whole world and build it together. The Porsche guys in Weissach started to build it up and then they stopped when they stopped the project. And we finished it now uh, about 30 years later. <laughs> it's nearly 800 horsepower. No ABS, no traction control, no, no, nothing, nothing at all? Special. It's a car for men. <laughs> A car designed by Norbert Singer with a new engine, the result of tireless work in exploiting loopholes in the regulations. Sheer sleekness enabled them to reach 366 kilometers per hour down the Molsan Strait. This very much a car designed to win the 24-hour race at Le Mans until an oil leak was detected during that race, forcing the driver to ease off. The Moby Dick finished eighth in the 1978 edition of Le Mans, won by the Renault Alpine of Didier de Peroni and Jean-Pierre Jossot. 
20 years later, though, Stefan Ortelli was required at Le Mans together with Laurent Aurelio and Alain McNeat at the wheel of a Porsche GT1. And now he's at Spa in the Moby Dick. Well, for me, roll on the championship. It's huge because I've watched these cars run as a child and they really made me want to do the 24 hours of Le Mans and become a racing driver. It's amazing to drive. Uh, it's a great lesson humility. It's so powerful. It's a complete monster to drive, really. It's impressive from outside, but also at the wheel. I can guarantee you that. Will I drive? Uh, I don't really control. I imagine the drivers who were talking about understeer, oversteer, the onboard cameras right up the time when we just look across. They may know very little in terms of safety, but it's just incredible. It makes me so humble when you look at the risks they used to take. Well, fun for the newcomers, but also for the regulars in the shape of Jacques Nicolet. Although he also runs modern cars, he also needs his fix of classic endurance racing. Well, it's about the history. Uh, this is where I started competing. For me, it's my roots which are very important. I take uh, a lot of fun from coming up to an exceptional day on the classic endurance racing. I'm both pleased to meet friends, uh, also to see some beautiful cars, and I've also, of course, here, I'm able to ride in them as well. It's a pleasure that's so different from the modern cars, and the stakes simply aren't the same. I have more fun riding with my son, not in the same car, of course, but in the same competition. So it really is a great moment of happiness. Even more surprisingly, there are some rally drivers here too. Here's Patrick Henry, French champion in 2007 in a Peugeot 307. He succumbed to the charms of the CER in which he participated at the wheel of a Rondo 379C from 1979. We put together a small team to deal with old cars with uh, La Rondo and modern cars in uh, Chenevière where I work. Uh, it's great fun, it's a French car, I'm happy to drive, especially of course at Spa. We've already run at the Le Mans Classic last year for our first race and you know, then we started in the championship just to uh, see what that was about. We were seventh at Navarre for the opening of that championship, which was pretty good, but we've now tried to move forward and understand the car. Well, there are trees, Forest, uh, you should remember your real job perhaps. Oh, the road though is a little wide. Beautiful people, beautiful cars, beautiful weather. All the ingredients are right there for a great race. In a pole position, the Belgian driver Loïc Deman in a prototype Ocella PA4 after a lap at an average speed of over 173 kilometers an hour. At his side on the front row is Patrice Lafargue in a Lola T298 BMW. Michael Kino also in a Lola is third, while Jacques Nicolet, the leader of the championship in a Gulf Mirage M3, is in fourth. The prototypes certainly ruling the roost here. Up the first turn, it's Deman in the lead while Quigno manages to get ahead of Lafargue. Only 30th on the grid, the Ferrari 712 of London to Paul Natfield is out of place. It's all about the 800 brake horsepower he has under his right foot. And coming up on your screen is Jean-Claude Andrea, yet another legendary driver at this rate. The Ferrari could soon swallow the cheetah prototype that he shares with Jean-Marie Beltest. Well, I've been here before, many memories at Spa and of Belgium. Well, I've won at Spa the 24-hour uh, the 600 kilometers, so I have great memories here and people are really friendly to me because they remember all of that. Well, there was no real safety. I mean, there wasn't even a track at the start of things. I ran a prototype 3 liter in the World Championship without anything. At uh, Blanchimont, it was on the verge of the fir trees. Any sort of mistake on Blanchimont would have been fatal. At ease in running or on hill climb circuit, Jean-Claude André 
triumphed on all fronts and continues to have great vibrations in a sports car. Returning to the race, Demand continues to lead Kino while Nicolet has risen to third. The GT class is currently led by the Porsche 935 of Fauvenay, which has managed to get the better of the Ligier JS3 of Jean-Marc Luco. Well, after just one lap, Paul Napfield has already taken 10 places, though he's still 20th and with plenty left to do. Another 11 positions taken for the Ferrari on the second lap while Loic Demain continues to stretch away from Kino, who's now threatened by Nicolet. And now I think we'll just move aboard that Gulf Mirage for the passing manoeuvre. In the GT category, the Porsche 935s are very much the life of the party, although that's mostly because the Moby Dick of Stefan Ortelli suffered a turbo problem. The man from Monaco returns to the pits to explain the symptoms to his engineer. Finally, it was decided to pull out or risk a full engine failure. They're hoping to come back in the future, though. Meanwhile, Loic Demain also had to leave the race due to an engine problem on his Ocella. Jacques Nicolet then, the new leader, and he's among the first to come in for his obligatory pit stop. That gave Paul Natfield the opportunity to sail into the lead before he also had to come into the pits. On his return to the track, Napfield now 20 seconds behind the mirage of Jacques Nicolet, who seems to be moving towards his second straight win. However, that mechanical progress was jammed of just four laps left in the race. Well, just outside the pits, a bit of a misunderstanding there on the corner, and that's the end of his race. Jean Nicolet now out of the way, the road opens up for Paul Napfield, but in GT, Jean-Michel Martin in his Porsche 935 wins the race. Here's Napfield, says it's really hard, the car's heavy and I'm really hot now. Well, Patrice Lafargue and Frédéric de Rocha completed the podium for the prototypes, while the winners of the GT race were a little more vocal. Well, I'm not a great driver, I manage, but I'm more of a mechanic and it's very nice to be here today, especially with Jean-Michel, who I thank from the bottom of my heart. This car was found in a real state. We did what we could. It was very nicely finished and we did well throughout the race without taking risks. The goal was just to reach the finish. So if you count your victories in touring cars, how many have you had it here at Spa? Well, touring cars, I'm fortunate to have won four times a 24-hour race. I know each gradient by heart and I'd love to drive an F1 car here if I had the opportunity. While another time perhaps a Group C car, who knows? It's a great track though, regardless of the car that you're driving. Marc Dessian Bental and Jean-Michel Martin ahead of a Ferrari 712 BB and then Michel Fauvney in his 935, the early leader. 
Swifty moving on then to the Group C race for cars from the golden age of sports prototype racing in the late 80s and early 90s. 1990 saw the Silver Arrows of Mercedes return to competition for the first time since the Le Mans tragedy of 1955. The new Silver Arrows C11 blasted away the opposition then. And 21 years later, nothing has changed. Bob Berridge and Christian Glessel continuing the tradition. Well, this race requires just one pit stop. Of course, in their own era, the 1,000 horsepower that they produced was simply stunning. Bob Berridge then handing over the control to Christian Glessel, who had almost a lap over Japanese driver Katsu Kubota. He's in second place, driving a Nissan R90C. Ferdinand de Lesseps, a former world champion in the C2 class, was third in his spice. Well, victory secured then, along with the fastest lap of Christian Glesson. It looks like he's had quite an experience as he gets out of the car. actually the car which won here at Spa in 1990. Um, but yeah, it's very exhausting experience, but uh, of course a huge honor to drive such a car here. We end our tour back in time with the Boss GP cars, a series created in 2009 by four Dutch friends who want to remove the old F1 cars and other one-seaters from the museums. This perhaps a Dutch speciality, and there was certainly evidence of that in the shape of an amazing duel set by Klaus Zwart and Marin van Klamtoet, both in circa 1997 Benetons that year. With the same car, John Alessi achieved the second best lap time of 1 minute 49.759 behind Jacques Villeneuve, the future world champion of that season. Van Klamtoet, well, he took pole in 2 minutes, 1 second, 9.36 seconds, but it's difficult to compare performance. The circuit is slower now with a relatively new bus stop chicane near the end of the lap. And the Benettons are no longer powered by the Renault engine of the time, but by 4-litre Judd V10. Still, managing to average over 200 kilometres per hour is more than a respectable performance. Klaus Zwart, a victory in the first race, although there's soon a chance for some revenge. With a starting grid determined by results of the first race, Zwart has a great advantage with the determined driving of Marian Klamthut could well make a difference here. Klamtut with his Benetton in the team's original colours is held up in Zwart's wake. Now the first attempt to pass was perhaps a little optimistic. Benetton driver certainly outbreaking himself there, but the second attempt would be successful, and in doing so, he took the checkered flag by just 171 milliseconds. The friendly atmosphere on the podium, faces may be a little wrinkled, and the hair a little bleached for F1 drivers, but the eyes shine like those of children. <laughs> Well, that was the first edition of the Spa Classic, a brand new event played out in front of some 10,000 visitors, delighted with the spectacle, both on the track and in the paddock. An event that will certainly continue for 2012. The Spa Classic promises to be even more spectacular than before. Goodbye for now.